Welcome back everyone. Gleanings from the Minor Prophets. Well today, as we continue with our study of Micah, we pick up with chapter 5. We also are going to pull in portions of chapter 4 as we reflect on the questions um, from last week. One very specifically only in chapters 4 and 5, which day or days was the Lord referring to? We see that phrase used a lot in the minor prophets and some of the major prophets. Well, before we get into looking at that question, reflecting on that question, and then seeing how we can apply it to our lives, let's have prayer together. Father, we thank you for our time together around your word, in your word. Lord, speak to our hearts. Allow us to think deeply about what you're saying to uh, the contextual recipients of the prophecy. And then, Lord, what we can learn from it, what we can take away from it and apply to our lives. Father, thank you for speaking to us. You speak every time we read your word. Sometimes we just don't want to hear it. And Lord, forgive us in those moments. Forgive us in those dry places sometimes where we get spiritually. We can't hear you. We refuse to hear you. Oh, Lord, keep our ears open, our minds sharp, our heart in tune with you. Thank you for loving us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. Well, last week, uh, within the context of chapter 3, the Lord was speaking to Israel and Judah but he was specifically speaking to leaders, rulers, prophets, seers, diviners, and the judges. If he was speaking today, this prophecy to the church, he would be speaking to pastors, deacons, I believe deacons' wives, um, ministry team leaders, anyone who has a leadership position in the church. I believe the Lord would be speaking to us if this prophecy was for us directly. Well, it was interesting, I thought, in chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, that the Lord through Micah uh, was comparing Israel's leaders, their rulers, to cannibals. We talked about that last week. Um, He said, You who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who eat my people's flesh, strip off their skin and break their bones in pieces, who chop them up like meat for the pan, like flesh for the pot. See, the leaders, the rulers, those in authority, the prophets, the seers, the diviners, the judges, they were taking advantage of the people. They were giving prophecies, good prophecies in return for profit. And when people couldn't pay them or profit them in any way, they gave, they, 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 they almost like pronounced a curse on them. So they were illegitimate prophets, illegitimate leaders, But still, God had a plan. God had a purpose. We we can apply that to today. Even though we don't agree with the leadership of our country, uh, the leadership of our parish, maybe even the leadership of the church, um, God's got a plan. And we lean into that plan and we trust His plan. That's a great application. The cannibal metaphor, as we talked about last week, occurred also in New Testament times. Paul used it in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Micah's metaphor of cannibalism was about the leaders of Israel, but Paul's was about Christians. Not much has changed today, has it? From Old Testament times to New Testament times, even today, Paul talks about, warns about us devouring each other in division, lies, and deceit. So not much has changed from the Old Testament to now. I thought that was very interesting. And then in chapter 4, we saw, we see the phrases in verse 1, in the last days, and verse 6, in that day. Now adding to that chapter 5, which I asked you to read, verse 10, the phrase, in that day. So we see in the last days and in that day between chapters 4 and 5 mentioned twice and in that day mentioned once. So in that day, twice, in the last days, once. I might have had that backwards. So today, we're going to think through the question in chapters 4 and 5, which day or days was the Lord referring to? As I said last week, Micah's prophecy, much like the majority of the other minor prophecies and some of the major prophecies, was a double prophecy or a double fulfillment. Now, I changed that a little bit. I'll get get into that in just a minute. Now, we're presented with what I consider to be a triple 
prophecy, a triple fulfillment. Double prophecy, double fulfillment, I understand that, but I see a triple prophecy, a triple fulfillment, and I want to explain that. Now, this is the time when you need to put on your thinking caps. As we interact with the Word of God, every time we open the pages of the Word of God, there's something there that God is trying to teach us. There's something there that God wants us to hear, wants us to learn. It's up to us if we get it or not. So put on your thinking caps as we think through this process in the last days and in that day. What was God speaking about through Micah? Well, in the larger context of the book of Micah, we see right out of the gate in chapter 1, we're reaching back, both Israel, the ten northern tribes, and Judah, the two southern tribes mentioned. In the book of Micah, both tribes are mentioned. Micah's prophecy is double in regard to God's special chosen people to whom he was speaking. So it was double. Now before King Solomon's death, Israel was one tribe. After King Solomon's death, the tribe of Israel divided into two. The ten northern tribes, Israel or Jacob, and the two southern tribes, Judah. We see that in 1 Kings 12 and 2 Chronicles 10. Look at those references. 1 Kings 12 and 2 Chronicles 10. This shows us when the division of Israel occurred before King Solomon's death, then after King Solomon's death. So Micah's prophecy was double in the sense that God was going to judge both tribes, his total people of Israel, northern and southern. We also know that Israel was taken into captivity by the Assyrians, 2 Kings 18, 5 through 18, and Judah was taken captive by the Babylonian nation, 2 Kings chapters 24 and 25. Those are some cross-references. When I ask you to provide scripture references, this is what I'm talking about. Digging in the entire Word of God and finding those connections. It's very important as we study the Word of God. The way that we're doing it, we're making connections. We're, we're making connections from Genesis to Revelation. We're making those connections, then we're trying to make application. Israel was taken into the Syrian captivity. Then Israel, the northern kingdom, right along with the Syrians and Judah, the southern kingdoms, went into captivity to the Babylonians. So Assyria was the world power. Then the Babylonians swooped in and then became the new world power. Assyria took Israel Babylon took Judah and Assyria and everything they had. Israel becomes one for a brief moment. Both the remnant of Israel, the ten northern tribes and Judah, the southern tribes, were under Babylonian rule for 70 years. We know this. After the Babylonian captivity, the next large and in charge nation was Persia. Persia conquered Babylon and everything else. By the time of the New Testament, the new world power was whom? Rome. Rome in the New Testament became large and in charge. Israel, no longer a united kingdom, even through to today. Israel is not a united kingdom. They are still dispersed. They are sp still fragmented. There is a remnant. So I want us to get into the phrases in the last days and in that day. But before we do that, I do want us to briefly think about the remnant. Now remnant, very simply, is a leftover scrap a la leftover amount from a larger portion or a larger piece. Now an example, biblical examples of, of a remnant. Noah and his family were the remnant 
saved out of the millions of people on the earth before the flood, Genesis chapter 6. That's a scripture reference, Genesis chapter 6. Lot and his two daughters were a remnant from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. In 1 Kings 19, that's another scripture reference, God assured Elijah that he had reserved a remnant of 7,000 people, 7,000 Israelites, his chosen people, whose knees had not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths had not kissed Baal. God promised he would always have a remnant of his special chosen people, Israel. Now, in Romans chapter 9, verses 27 through 29, Paul wrote this. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. God promised a remnant. And he still, here in 2022, has a remnant, but they're dispersed. They're exiles in a foreign land, just like us, the church. We are exiles here. We do not belong here anymore, in, with, and through Christ. We don't belong here. Our home is not here. Our home is with Him in heaven. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where rust and moth destroy. Instead, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, reserved, kept, protected, safe. This is not our home. That's an encouragement of application that we can take from this book. Paul, even in Romans 11, 25 through 31, that's another reference. Romans 11, 25 through 31, Paul alludes to a remnant of Israel being saved in the last times. This means that when we read Micah and other minor prophetic books, Israel wants one, divided into two, will be one again under the final reign and rule of Jesus Christ. Thankfully, we the church have been grafted in. When it's all said and done, when everyone and every nation has been judged, including the church, Christ will rule as final sovereign and Lord forever and ever can I get an amen? Amen. Now let's look at the specific phrases within Micah 4 and 5. We're getting into what I call, what I have termed in my study, triple prophecy, triple fulfillment. Three. The first two phrases. Micah 4 1 through 7, we'll see the two phrases mentioned. Follow along as I read. Follow along. Micah 4, 1 through 7. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's tremble. Um, let me start over. <clears throat> Micah 4. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob, which is Israel. He will teach us His ways so that we may walk in His paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. 
Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. The Lord's plan in that day, declares the Lord. I will gather the lame, I will assemble the exiles and those I have brought to relief, to grief. I will make the lame my remnant, those driven away, those driven away a strong nation. The Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion from that day and forever. Has this occurred? Chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Has that occurred? Yes, no. First, yes, no. After the Babylonian exile, the remnant of Israel was allowed to return to Jerusalem. They were allowed to return to their homeland and reestablish themselves, including their worship of one true God. The mountain of the Lord's temple was reestablished. Now, we read about that reestablishment in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. But it still wasn't an everlasting temple. You saw that there. Forever and ever. Everlasting. So verses 1 through 7 is a yes-no. They were, after the Babylonian captivity, they were allowed to go into reestablish the, their, their home, reestablish the temple, their worship of one true God, Ezra and Nehemiah. But it wasn't everlasting. Second, after the Babylonian exile, there was peace, but not an everlasting peace. But there will be a future in time peace, like the peace described in verse 3. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Peace. We still today pray for peace of Jerusalem because it's still not there in 2022. So this, when we read the book of Micah, it is a triple prophecy with triple fulfillment. Some things were fulfilled within the lifetime of the Old Testament saints, if you will. Some were fulfilled in the New Testament. Some parts of it will be fulfilled at the end times. Triple. Boom, boom, boom. Verses 6 and 7 of chapter 4 is also a yes-no. After the Babylonian captivity, the Lord did not rule over the remnant in Mount Zion. He did rule, but not forever. They worshipped the one true God, but not forever. They went right back into their idolatry. After Babylon, a season of purity and worship, a season of peace, then here comes the Persians because sin, Israel sinned again against the Lord. God said, okay, you forgot about the Babylonian captivity. Probably most of them were dead at the time, but their descendant, their, their generation is still to come. They knew about it because they told their stories verbally. So after the Babylonian captivity, there was peace. There was worship of one true God. They fell right back into sin. God sent the Persians to judge them. Then in the New Testament, here comes Rome. Israel remained a remnant. Still to this day, they're a remnant. So that was the two, that was the two phrases in chapter 4, in the last days, verse 1, and verse 6, in that day. Triple prophecy, triple fulfillment. Some were fulfilled in, within the Old Testament, some were fulfilled in the New Testament, and some are still out there to be fulfilled. So the last phrase, chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. Continue following along with me. I appreciate you doing that. 5, 1 through 15. Let me get my pages ready. 
Get me a sip of my coffee. Chapter 5. Marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will rule over Israel with origins are from of old, ancient times. John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. Ephesians 2.14, run that cross-reference. And he will be our peace when the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortresses. We will rise against them seven shepherds, even eight commanders. Question you should ask there, is that literal or metaphorical? Verse 6. Who will rule the land of Assyria with the sword, the land of Nimrod with drawn sword? He will deliver us from the Assyrians when they invade our land and march across our borders. The remnant of Jacob, Israel, will be in the midst of many peoples like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass which do not wait for anyone or depend on man. The remnant of Jacob will be among the nations in the midst of many peoples like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among flocks of sheep which mauls and mangles as it goes and no one can rescue. Your hand will be lifted up in triumph over your enemies and all your foes will be destroyed in that day, declares the Lord. I will destroy your horses from among you and demolish your chariots. I will destroy the cities of your land and tear down all your strongholds. I will destroy your witchcraft and you will no longer cast spells. I will destroy your idols and you, your sacred stones from among you, you who no longer bow down to the work of your hands. I will uproot from among you your astera poles when I demolish your cities. I will take vengeance and anger and wrath on the nations that have not obeyed me. So we see there in chapter 5, remnant mentioned, the Syrians mentioned, some shepherd of some sort. In verse 10, that phrase, in that day. And then at verse 10 to, the, to verse 15, that's a direct quote from the Lord. Let's think back through that, in that day. Verses 1 and 3, chapter 5, verses 1 and 3. Those were strictly within context of Micah, Israel, and Judah, the Syrians, eventually leading to the Babylonian captivity. But what about verse 2? Look back with me at verse 2, chapter 5. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Now some cross-references you can run there. Psalm 90, verse 2, what I mentioned already. John 1, 1. Within the direct context of Micah, verses one, I'm sorry, verse two 
hadn't happened yet. Within the direct context of Micah, the Old Testament, verse 2 hadn't happened yet. But it will in the future, which is the Old Testament, I mean the New Testament, the birth of Jesus. That verse is speaking to a prophecy that did not happen within Micah's lifetime or the Old Testament. It happened in their future, the New Testament. Well, for us, it's our past. This still plays into that triple, triple. When will there be a complete restoration of Israel? Yeah, you, you know it. When will the majority of the events in most of the prophetic books come to culmination? Remember that word from Sunday's message, culmination, at Christ's second coming. At Christ's second coming, when all is said and done, Israel will be united. The church will will be united, grafted in to Israel at Christ's second coming. This is why I call it a triple, triple prophecy, triple fulfillment. And we, we looked at the text last, this past Sunday, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17, Revelation 21, Revelation 22, we see the culmination of the Old Testament prophets, those that didn't, that wasn't answered within the direct context of the book of Micah, those that weren't answered in the context of the Old Testament were answered in the New Testament. Some of them, most of them, many of them are still hanging out there in the future, our future, at end times. What was the starting point? Think about this. The starting point that eventually gets Israel and gets us, the church, to God's culmination through Jesus Christ is Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Listen to this. There's a bug in here. Genesis 3, 14 and 15. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So we study the book of Micah, we're able to reach back to Genesis. We're able to reach to the New Testament and on into the book of Revelation, another book of prophecy that points us to a future still awaited culmination of Jesus Christ, the kingdom. It's a wonderful example of how the entire word of God works together as a complete whole from Genesis to Revelation. It's a complete picture of God his promises, his, 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 his prophecies through his minor prophets, major prophets, answered in Jesus Christ, in the New Testament, his birth, his death, burial, resurrection, and on into the book of Revelation for future when it's all said and done in times the millennial kingdom and Christ will reign. I don't know about you, but this is a lot of information and my brain is about to explode. Isn't it wonderful how the Word of God works? It's amazing. It's amazing. One of the most amazing parts about the Word of God is how He, was, how he used man. How He used flawed mankind to participate in His Word. It's amazing. Well, what applications can we make from this? There are several. I only want to mention three. God will not tolerate sin. Now that's been the song through all the minor prophets. God will not tolerate sin. Do you apply that to your lives? We need to apply that truth to our lives every day. God will not tolerate sin. Second one that's really cool or good application. God is always with us despite our failures. 
His promises are true. He will answer every promise. He will fulfill every promise. He promised Israel will always have a remnant. They still do today, 2022. God's promise to us in through with Jesus Christ, life everlasting, a hope, a crown. And third, another way of ap- applying this is ties really nicely into Sunday's message. It's for our encouragement. We have a glorious grafted in future. God will call out from the earth all His chosen people. The remnant of Israel, you, me, everything and everyone, Israel, you, me, all of creation will be restored to perfection. God created in perfection. It was perfection that He created. We were flawed because of sin. We became distorted. And when Christ returns, perfection comes back. We are set right. We're able to be with God. He will restore everything to perfection. Micah 4, 5b, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God perfectly without sin forever and ever. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. This world is not our home. We're just a passing through. Those are just some brief applications that you can make. There are others there. So let's look to next week. Next, re- next week, I need you to read chapter six, and s- <clears throat> chapter 6 and 7. Chapter 6 and 7. Read that for next week. We're going to finish the book of Micah, and then we're going to take a break, and then we'll dive into the next minor prophet. So read chapter 6 and 7 and then answer the following questions. One, what other Old Testament book have we read that reminds you of Micah 6 and 7? As you read Micah 6 and 7, pull back uh, to your forefront of your thinking, of your mind, what book uh, it sounds like. It's obvious to me. I mean, it was obvious to me what book it sounded like. So, what other Old Testament book have we read that reminds you of Micah 6 and 7? Number two, what did, here's application, what did and does the Lord require of His people? From chapter 6 and 7, what did and does the Lord require of His people? Provide scripture references, please. And then three, two parts to three, where else in the Bible do we see Micah 7, 5, and 6 repeated. Where else in the Bible do we see Micah chapter 7, verses 5 and 6 repeated? We see Micah 7, 5, and 6 repeated somewhere else in the Word of God. Where is it? Provide your scripture references. And then B, when were these events going to occur? When you read chapter 7, Excuse me, about to sneeze. When you read chapter 7, verses 5 and 6, when do these events occur? When are they going to occur? Very simply. Here's the questions again. What other Old Testament book have we read that reminds you of Micah 6 and 7? Two, what did and does the Lord require of His people? Provide scripture references. 3a, where else in the Bible do we see Micah 7, verses 5 and 6 repeated? And then the B part, when were these events going to occur? Provide scripture references. Well, I hope you're still enjoying the book of Micah. I am. It's just wonderful to sit back and to see the Word of God working within itself. It's amazing. It's amazing to run cross-references and to see how the dots are connected from Genesis to Revelation. Um, Like I've said many times as we read and study a book of the Bible, sometimes there's a whole lot of application and sometimes there's not. But we are studying it together and that's what matters. Keep on studying. Keep on handing in your homework. You've been faithful to do that. Even if you say, I I don't know, but I think this, that's okay. That's all right. It's not about that. It's just about we're studying the Word of God together. Well, I love you and I appreciate you allowing me to lead you in this way. Let's pray, and we will um, call it quits for our Bible study tonight. 
Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you love us so much that you've given it to us. Lord, as we interact with it, may its truth ring in our ears. May its truth ring in our minds and in our hearts. May we act, may we live out what we read, what we interact with, a living word. Sometimes, Father, it falls on dead ears and dead hearts and dead brains for one reason or another. But your word will accomplish what you have set it out to do. And I, as a Bible teacher, rest in that. Thank you for using me to lead your people at Emmanuel. What a blessing. What an honor. Teach us together. Show us more of you together. Show us more of how we can be like Jesus Christ in our ministries together. Thank you for the encouragement that we've received from your word tonight. What a hope and a future we have. You're with us every time, even in our failures, you're with us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. You will have a remnant, and we are part of that as your church. Thank you, Father. We love you. We honor you. We praise you. We exalt you. Thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I love you. Y'all have a good evening. And um, I hope to see you uh, tonight. If you're watching this Wednesday, tonight, Wednesday night, we have a business meeting and a family forum beginning at 530. I have a, a video to show you, and then we have some discussion to have together about our building and facilities. I right, love you. See you Wednesday night, tonight, or Sunday.